morning. Welcome to Upwards. Will y'all stand and worship with us this morning? Oh, I have days I lose the fight. Try my best, but just don't get it right. defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him. My Father's God and I will exalt him. Exodus 15 2. Amen. <laughs> Oh 
Welcome, welcome to Upwards. Thank you for being here today. If you came in and you are new, hopefully you received a free gift. It's our way of saying we are honored you chose to worship with us today. You, in your program, you will find a connection card. Looks something like this, but a little bit smaller. You can fill out and everything that you're comfortable filling out and put that in the offering boxes as you leave. You can do the same thing on our app and you can give on the app safely as well. So the Church Center app and you can download that. We, in your connection card also, you have information on, about our connect groups, and they're also at the connection center, as well as ministry teams. We'd love to have you participate with us. We dive deeper in what we're doing on Sunday, and we get to know each other better, and we get to know Christ better as well. On Mother's Day, we will have a child dedication, so if you're interested in dedicating your child, sign up for that on your program or in the connection, so on your connection card or in the connection center. Welcome to the jungle. Sorry, I had to do that. We're having VBS this summer, um, June 10th through the 13th. If you would like for your kids to participate, you can scan the QR code and sign them up for that. And I think that's it. Uh, volunteers. Oh, and volunteers, please. Many hands make light work. Mm -hmm. So we'd love to have you participate with us. Let's continue in worship. <clears throat> There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. With all the love I've ever found. 
great to see each of you here today. Welcome. Today's a great day that we're going to break bread together in fellowship. So there's plenty of food. If you'll please join us right after the service, we've got a great meal. It'll be great to sit down and eat with uh, old friends and meet some new friends. Also, we'll be breaking bread uh, together in communion. And so when you came in today, hopefully you received the elements. If not, you can go ahead and pick those up back here at this little station here or when you first walk in the double doors. We're doing a brand new series uh, called Return, and we're looking at the minor prophets. So if you have your Bible and you want to turn to the book of Joel, that might be like the sticky section, you know, where the pages are all stuck together, but that's where we'll be in the, the book of Joel. So we'll put up the Bible bookshelf as a reminder that we're going through all the books of the Bible. There are 66 of them, and they're broken into two major sections, Old and New Testaments, and so the Bible that we have from God has been given to us uh, 66 books written by over 40 authors over a 1500 year period written from three different continents all with the same unifying message about Jesus Christ. So we're finding ourselves right there in that middle section right there on that second level the minor prophets and when I say minor prophets and then you read major prophets don't think baseball okay it's not like big league and little leagues. It's not what we mean by that. Major means that there's more volume to the writing. Minor just means that there's less writing. But how many of you know that smaller is not necessarily less powerful, right? Have you ever noticed that? Viruses are small, but they can take you down. When I'm out working in the yard and I may have my flip-flops on and a little fire ant will sting me on the toe, I stop everything that I'm doing to, to look after that little fire ant that's causing me so much discomfort. And so the minor prophets are the same way. I mean, they have a pack. They, they, they pack a punch, if you will. And so I just want you to know that. Just because it says minor, don't think it's a minor message or a minor impact. No. It's just less of it, but full contact. So I want you to know about that. Now, the thing about these minor prophets, this is fascinating. There are 12 of them. Now, 12 to the Hebrew mindset means completeness. So in other words, the, the, the God's people, the Israelites, they saw these 12 12 prophets as having a complete message. And so it's, 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 it's completeness. There were 12 tribes of Israel, completeness, authority. There were 12 disciples, right? Completeness given authority. So these 12 prophets, there's a complete message that's going to run through every single one of them. And so as you're reading the minor prophets, you can begin to pick up on some of this same message throughout. Four things, big things, this is on the blog, by the way, if you want to go and read more about this. Upwards.blog. Four messages, unifying messages through all the, the minor prophets. Number one is this. God is loving. God is compassionate. God is merciful. How many of you have experienced that from God? The love, the compassion, the mercy from Almighty God. It's amazing. Number two, human beings are unfaithful. <laughs> we are sinners. We have a loving, faithful, compassionate God, and we reject Him, we rebel against Him, we say no, we do our own thing. How many of you know that that's the condition of humanity? You, 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 you live that, you feel that. God is faithful. Humans are unfaithful. Number three, another common message that runs through all 12 of them, God will bring judgment. We're going to talk about this today. This is another common theme throughout all of these prophets is that, yes, God is faithful and loving. Man sins. What is God? about that, he's going to bring judgment. And he does bring judgment. A holy God will deal with all sin. And then number four, the need for a Savior. So all the twelve of them are pointing us to a greater reality found in Jesus Christ. We are sinners in need of a Savior. Like Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me? Christ Jesus, that's who saves us. So we have a loving God and a sinful people a God that will bring judgment, but then he ultimately brings that judgment upon his own son, Jesus Christ. And we become 
he takes our sin. And so he replaces where we should have gone. He takes that for us. And so that's why we'll be observing communion because that's a very important truth is that the perfect Lamb of God took upon himself the sin that you and I committed and that we deserve the punishment. He took it upon himself. What great news that is. And so that's kind of the, the, the theme, the unifying theme of these 12, these complete authoritative prophets. So we're looking at Joel today. And so we can also read along if you want to read along. We read this last week through uh, the book of Joel. Just three chapters. Fast. It, go, it moves quick. We're starting tomorrow reading through the book of Amos. And so if you want to join us, you can find version, Download that. Find Upwards Church. And then we'll invite you to the reading plan. It's so amazing to talk about it on Sunday and then read about it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, get with your group, talk about it some more, ask questions. It's a great way to learn together. So we're very excited about the opportunities that we have to engage in God's Word, grow in God's Word, and uh, understand Christ and His Word so much better. All right, let's, uh, if you have your Bible, turn to Joel, or if you have that outline, you can pull that out. And our series is called Return, and then we're going to just pull from the scriptures that actually talk about where this word return is mentioned. So Joel is actually using this word a couple times in chapter 2. He says, even now, which means today is the day, if you haven't done that, if you haven't returned to the Lord, if you haven't given your heart to Jesus, if you haven't confessed your sins, today's the day. Now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Meaning we should have a change on the inside. I reminded the story of this little boy. He, he was, you know, being indignant and disobedient. He kept standing up. His mom's like, sit down, sit down. And he was standing up. So she finally like set him down and he clenched through his little teeth. He said, I, I may be sitting down on the, the uh, outside, but on the inside, I'm standing up. <laughs> Any of you ever done that? You know, it's like on the inside, we, th that's where we have to change as well. Not just on the outside, not just a show, but deep inside where, where to change. Return to the Lord your God for he is, here's a question, How, what is God like? There it is, he's gracious, full of grace, he's compassionate, he has compassion upon us, he is slow to anger, unlike us, we're fast to anger, God is slow to anger, abounding in love, in other words, it's just like uncountable, unmeasurable amount of love that God has, don't you love that about God? Compassionate, merciful, loving, and he relents from sending calamity, meaning that today the day to receive Jesus and have salvation, not judgment. It's a choice. You, you can not receive the calamity of judgment by receiving Jesus. So this is where we get the word return because the prophets are telling people to return to the Lord. All right. Um, let me pray and then we're going to dive in a little bit more. Let us pray. Father, thank you. For your word. Thank you for the time we have together. Thank you that you are the one who saves us from our sins. Lord, we acknowledge that you are full of grace, love, and compassion, and that we are unfaithful. Lord, today I pray that we'll understand you more and we'll draw closer to you, and our hearts will be yours. Speak to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we, now we have a, a little overview. And so the author of this book, his name is Joel. Now, Joel, the word Joel, it, it means Yahweh is God or the Lord is God. So the word El is God, and so Yo is short for Yahweh or Jehovah. So his name means the Lord is God. What a great name. His dad, his name is Pethuel, which means persuaded by God. And so guess what? That's all we know about this guy. That's all we know about him is that his name was Joel and he had a dad that means persuaded by God. We're not quite sure from his writing exactly when he lived. It's not specific. We can draw a few little clues about when this might be, but we're not totally sure. So just need to understand that. Uh, purpose is to warn of that day of the Lord. How many of you have heard of the term day of the Lord? Any of y'all ever heard that term before? That term, day of the Lord, you could like... That means the same thing as the Great Tribulation. How I many of you have heard of the, the Great Tribulation? The Great Tribulation is found in Revelation 6 through 19, this coming judgment of God. So day of the Lord and Great Tribulation are once an Old Testament expression... 
Great Tribulation, capital T, is a New Testament uh, understanding of that. So that's one of his purposes, is to explain that there is going to be a coming judgment, and it's to the people of Judah. He did live in the south. We can pull that from understanding. He talks about Zion. He talks about the priesthood. He talks about uh, Jerusalem. And so we, we understand that he's to the south, and written in about 835 B.C., which would make him one of the first prophets to write things down. So we're going to show you a, a timeline just so we can understand uh, God's redemptive history. Now you can see that uh, we have what's called a united kingdom where King Saul, King David, and, and King Solomon, they, they reign and Solomon builds the temple about 957. And then the kingdom gets divided to a north and a south. And so there's two different kingdoms and that happened about 930 BC. And then notice this is about when Joel speaks. So all of the prophets, all the minor prophets, all the major prophets, they're doing their ministry during this divided kingdom portion. So Joel is one of the very first prophets. And the reason that they think that Joel and Amos were contemporaries is because Amos actually quotes from Joel. He, 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 and Isaiah actually quotes from Joel. So you have these later prophets quoting from this earlier prophet. Notice in the red, this is preaching to the southern kingdom. Next week we'll be looking at Amos Famous Amos, that'll be next week. Famous Amos uh, was ministering to the northern kingdom. So we'll be looking at him next time. So that's a little bit of a timeline of how God is unfolding his history. And I also want to read to you from Joel 1.1. 1, 1. It says, the word of the Lord, capital L-O-R-D. Now we talked about this before. When you have a capital L-O-R-D, what that means is, is that is the covenant name of God. That is Yahweh, that is translated, I am that I am. Remember in the burning bush, Moses says, well, who do I tell him sent me to deliver the people? You tell him I am sent you. I am that I am sent you. So I am is the terminology that Jesus referred to himself as. I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. So Jesus would often take on the title as I am. So when I read the it says, the word of Jesus came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. So that's how I see it. I see this is a message from Jesus to this prophet, which actually is also to us as well. So we have Joel, and Joel is this first prophet, and he is going to be prophesying these four truths we already talked about. God is gracious. Man's unfaithful. Judgment's coming. <laughs> we looked at Jesus. Now, when it comes to learning the Bible, I, I, I do a few little things in my mind to try to help me understand. One of the things I try to do is I try to boil it down into like one word or one statement. For instance, Genesis. I think of beginnings. Genesis. Exodus. I think of deliverance. Leviticus. I think of the law, ceremonial and civil. Deuteronomy, I think of retelling the law. Joshua, I think of the conquest. Judges, I think of that chaotic, you know, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That chaos time, judges. Uh, Ruth, I think of redemption. Hosea, remember we looked at Hosea last year? Don't you think of Gomer, the prostitute? And so when it comes to Joel, here's your word. Locust. <laughs> what, what? Locust? Yeah, there it is. I want you to think about locust because that's how he starts his book, talking about the locust. That is an actual picture of a locust from Israel in 1915. In 1915, in Israel, there was a locust invasion that came into the land. And there was pictures. We're going to show you some pictures. But it was a devastating type of, it was a plague of biblical proportions in 1915. And so this was a very big deal to the people in 1915, the Americans that were there that took pictures. This is actually a picture from the National Archives. National Geographic actually did a picture of this. There is a tree, notice that tree, with all of its leaves, okay? Now, that's what the tree looked like before the locust. There's the tree after the locust. 
not a leaf on there. I mean, they'll even eat down to the branches and eat into the bark. You talk about some real pesky critters. That's what those are. Someone during the first service said, they even ate the man. <laughs> and uh, that made me think about the fact that I saw pictures of the locusts covering people's clothing. And they said that you had to cover up your baby because the locusts could eat the eyes out of a child. <laughs> yeah, yuck. So that's what would happen. Every piece of greenery would be completely devastated by a locust invasion. Now, just look at the sky. Here's another picture. This is actually a picture of this event taking place. Notice all the, it's like hail. There would be so many locusts it could cover up the sun. Yuck. Now, this happened during Joel's lifetime, and so he's writing to the people, reminding them, hey, remember that locust invasion, how the locusts came in and they ate everything. Remember how hard it was? The animals were hungry. The, the, <laughs> there was no wine. There was no grain. Everything was completely eaten up. It was a national disaster. And by the way, remember in Deuteronomy 28, God actually says, hey, if you don't follow me, then I'm going to take my hand off and there's going to be some calamity that's going to befall you. In other words, God has a way of putting a hedge around us. Now, how many of you know that God protects us, right? And he blesses us and he, and he takes care of us, but when we go our own way, we get out from underneath God's protection and bad things can happen to us. And this is what the people of God were experiencing. They were experiencing rebellion and God allowing these things to remind them that they lived under God's control, guidance, and they were away from him. So that's how Joel starts this book, is by saying, okay, this plague was bad, but guess what? There are going to be things that are going to be worse than that. Worse, yeah, can you imagine? And so we read Revelation 6 through 19, and we realize, man, yeah, that's pretty bad. Uh, that's, that's the judgment of Almighty God. So this is how he starts out his, his book, just saying, yeah, th this, this is a reality, but judgment is also a reality. So number one, the, the first point on your outline is this, that we need to turn from sin, turn from sin, because God's judgment is coming. So turn. This is also the word repent. When Jesus came onto the scene, when John the Baptist came onto the scene in the New Testament, that was their message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. This is the same message throughout the, the whole Bible. If you're going down the wide path of destruction and, and you're living a sinful life, there comes a time where you have to say, okay, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm getting off the wide road and I'm getting on the narrow road. Which means that you have to turn off that road and turn down a different road. The road of Jesus, the road of repentance, the, the road that's narrow that leads to life. We have to make that decision. So we all have to come to that decision. Am I going to continue in my sin? Am I going to continue living the way that I want to live or am I going to turn away from that and say, no, that's not right. Let me turn to the Lord. Verse 15, alas, for that day. Now, we, we, we love making a big deal of certain days, don't we? Like, if it's your birthday, hey, we want to celebrate that. If it's our anniversary, we want to celebrate that. Independence Day, yay! We want to celebrate July 4th as Independence Day. Remember D-Day? Remember that? This is the day, man, we're going we're gonna to make a move here. Victory Day, V-E Day, Victory Day in, in Europe. I mean, what a day, right? God has a day as well. God has a day, and his day is the beginning of a period of judgment that's going to last seven years. So you have in the New Testament what's called the day of Christ. And so when Christ comes, his rapture, when he takes his church away, then that's going to begin a day of the Lord, which is about a seven-day period where God is going to bring judgment upon the planet and upon everyone who's been rebelling against him. So God's judgment is a real reality. Now, a lot of people have a hard time with God's judgment, and they get upset about that. And they're like, I can't believe you have such a judgmental God. <laughs> well, I just wanted to remind you all that all of us are made in God's image. And so being that we're image bearers, being that we're made in God's image, have you noticed 
that we have this sense of right and wrong, this sense of justice and injustice. How many of you have seen little kids who say, that's not fair? How many of you have ever said that? That's not fair. That's not right. And so we have this set of convictions and beliefs. And, and where do they come from? They come from Almighty God. God is the one who's placed these things inside of us to have a sense of right and wrong and, and what's right and what's fair and what's just and what's unjust. And injustice, it bothers us, doesn't it? And we don't like injustice. and We want something to be done about injustice. And so, let, just think about this for a second. Um, Often the people that say, oh, well, you're, you're God is judgmental, they're the same people. They're going to get mad at you for not using the right pronouns or, or for using fossil fuels or for being racist or whatever it may be. And we see that the people that don't like the judgment of God are actually more judgmental themselves. Have you noticed that? So what that means is that this actually goes back to Genesis chapter 3 where the serpent lied and says, oh, you can be like God. And so you have these people running around thinking that they're God, that, that they can decide what's right and wrong, and that God has no business deciding what's right and wrong. No, this is God's universe. If you, like Dr. J. Vernon McGee says, if you don't like it, you go find another universe. But this is God's universe. This is his home. This is his planet. He, you're his creation. He put you here on this. He made you from the dust of the ground. He breathed in you the breath of life. He gave you the DNA sequence. He coded it out. Your DNA is unlike anyone else on this entire planet. You've been made in the image of God by God. And guess what? We answer to God. Right. Not ourselves. So, let's just talk about ourselves for just a minute because being made in the image of God, how many of you, let's just be honest, how many of you struggle with a little bit of OCD tendencies? Anybody? I would... <laughs> I always feel that everyone has a little bit of obsessive abilities, you know, obsessive and compulsive about different things. And I'll just share a couple of my own uh, obsessive things and see if you might not relate to this, okay? Like in the bathroom, right? I mean, the, the toothpaste, right? How many of you know the toothpaste has to be squeezed from the bottom, right? Anybody know that? Well, Nikki likes to squeeze it from the middle. And so we're like, no matter how many times I tell her, no, you got to squeeze it from the bottom, she squeezes it from the middle. So anyway, that's just my obsessiveness. And, and what solves that is that she has her own toothpaste thing and I have my own two space thing. Now the toilet paper. How many of you know the toilet paper has to be on the top, right? Anybody top people? Any top people? How many know it's got to be on the bottom, right? And so if you find it on the bottom, you put it on the top. Or you find it on the top, you put it on the bottom. Any obsessive people about the toilet paper? It's got to be a certain way. How about the closet, right? In the closet, I don't know what it is about me, but I like to have my t-shirts and my colored shirts and, and long sleeve shirts. I mean, they're all separate. Anybody do that? Okay. And then my daughter was, was teasing me. She said, Dad, also tell them, mom bought some black coat hangers and some uh, white ones, and I put my black shirts on black coat, black hangers and the white shirts on white hangers. I don't know why. That's just, that's what I do. And so Nikki doesn't feel that way about the closet, and so she has her part. I don't even look at it, and I have my part, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have like a knife drawer, and to me, it just makes sense that with these drawers, you got the paring knives here, you got the steak knives here, you got the, the butcher knives here, and you got the watermelon knives here. It's just to me that makes sense. But then we have one of our daughters who just throws all the knives in there, and it's all mixed up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So we have these tendencies to say, hey, that's not right. I want it like this. The times I've gone to stay at Airbnb, even hotels, you read the house rules. You read the fine print. And you can get yourself into trouble if you don't follow the fine print. If, you, if it says no pets and you bring a pet, cha-ching, money. If it says no smoking and you smoke, cha-ching, money. If they say you need to do this and you don't do that, they're going to charge you. It's going to cost you. Why? It's their house. It's their property. And so you have to follow the house rules. Well, guess what? This is God's house. This is God's planet. This is God's universe. He can and he will judge. That's, what, that's just that's the nature of being God. We have a tendency to just kind of look the other way. I remember even as a kid thinking, hearing about 6th Street, right? You got to stay away from 6th Street because bad stuff can happen at 6th Street. We're like, okay, I'm going to avoid 6th Street. So it's human beings being kind of avoid certain things and look the other way. God is not that way. God is holy. 
God is righteous. God is just. He doesn't look the other way from sin. Right. Every sin will be dealt with. Every sin has a penalty. And the penalty must be paid. If you're an accounting type, two plus two is four. You're just not going to settle for five. It's just not going to happen, right? Or three. That's just not right. God's the same way. There is a way, and there is a certain way, and it's got to be this or else. And God's going to deal with that. So we just need to understand that's the nature of God. He's a holy God. He's a righteous God. He will deal with sin, meaning he'll deal with your sin. What are you going to do about your sin? Are you going to make excuses for it? Are you going to try to cover it up? Are you going to try to blame God for it or blame your family or blame your environment? Or are you going to say, nope, I accept what God says. The clear black and white truth of what God says. And all of us need to do that. If you've lied, you're a liar. If you've stolen, you're a thief. If you've lusted, you're an adulterer. If you've put something in front of God, you're an idolater. And just like, okay, that's what I am. I am a sinner in need of a Savior. But the good news is that we have a loving, compassionate God who says, okay, now that you've recognized what you are, let me help you out. So number one, we have to turn from sin. God's judgment is coming, period. Number two... Number two, return to God who's loving and gracious. We're not to beat ourselves up. We're not to go, oh, but there's no hope. No, there's so much hope. And the hope is found in Jesus Christ. Return to God. He's loving. He's gracious. He loves you. He made you. He just wants you to come to Him. Even now. Today, today is the day of salvation. Isn't this amazing? This book was written in 839 B.C. That's a long time ago. And yet it carries over to not only God's people then, but God's people today, this very day, even this very second, declares Jesus. L-O-R-D. Jesus is saying, return to me. How? With all of your heart. Remember when they asked Jesus, they said, hey, what's the greatest commandment? He didn't even miss obedience of the greatest commandment. So love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, mind, soul, strength. That's how we're to love God. And so we to return to Him. We don't just return to Him with some kind of a half-hearted, oh, I'll just go on Sundays and, you know, hit the time clock and, and be about my business. No, no, no. God wants all of us. Every aspect of life is under God's care, control, and blessing. So we're to love him with all that we are. And for some of us, it may take some fasting. Fasting means that you're going to not do something so that you can get closer to the Lord. Maybe you're going without a meal or without something to get closer to the Lord. And so sometimes it takes some fasting to say, I'm getting serious about this. I, I got to fast from this lifestyle or these people or this whatever that's pulling me away. Fasting, weeping. When is the last time that you felt really bad? about your sin? When's the last time that it brought a tear to your eye to realize, man, I've, I've let the Lord down? We saw this in Hosea that we looked at last year. Hosea was called to marry the prostitute Gomer as a word picture of the unfaithfulness of his people. And, and whenever we see unfaithfulness in a marital relationship, there's almost always tears, right? It's like somebody was unfaithful to the other person and there's weeping sorrow and sadness over that unfaithfulness. Have you been sad about your unfaithfulness to the Lord? It may take that to say, Jesus, I'm so sorry. I was unfaithful. I cheated on you. That's how we return. We return with all of our heart. We return willing to give up 
whatever we need to give up to get closer to the Lord. We return with a sense of heaviness, sorrow, weeping, sadness of what we've done and how it doesn't match up with God's standard. You know that God's not comparing you to anybody else? God doesn't grade on a curve. God's standard is perfection. And then there's us. So no looking at anyone else. You look at you and compare yourself to the standard, which is perfection. How do you measure up? That should break our heart. Lord, I'm sorry. Return to the Lord, for He is gracious and compassionate. Let's not ever forget that. What's our God like? He's gracious and compassionate. Abounding in love, and He relents from sending calamity. Some of us deserve calamity. We deserve judgment. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. So He will relent from sending that death sentence of judgment because of Jesus Christ. And so, yes, it's, it's such a, that's, that's why we're taking communion today because we recognize the fact that Jesus took what we deserved upon himself. And we remember his sacrifice, remember his love, his obedience. Who knows, maybe he will turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing. The word blessing means to add. It means to multiply. How many of you would like a blessing from God, right? Yes, we want for our family to be blessed. We want our finances to be blessed. We want our relationships to be blessed. We want our work to be blessed. How do we do that? By turning to the Lord and realizing that He's the true source of blessing, not the world and the world's lies and propaganda. The Lord and the Lord only is our source of blessing. So we turn, we turn to God who's loving and compassionate. Verse 25, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. I love that scripture. Isn't that good? Here a locust invasion comes in and, and, and devastates and destroys and wreaks havoc. And God says, I'm going to restore. Have you noticed that about God, how God has a way of restoring us? It's such a beautiful thing. I can't, I can't adequately even explain this, how, how good God is. How God can take our lives that are completely messed up and broken, and He can actually begin to bring about restoration and, 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 and add to our brokenness. And so if we're in Christ, we're, the old is gone, and now there's a new creation. And, and, and so the, the New Testament word is, is we're metamorphosized from this worm or this caterpillar. We're metamorphosized into this beautiful butterfly. We're now made in the image of, of God and, and we have Christ inside of our lives and it's just like, I, I, can't, I can't do it justice. But just, I want you to meditate on that this week. How has God restore, restored you? How has God blessed you since coming to Him? I think about the devastating effects of sin and how sin takes away so much from us. And because of Jesus, that we are restored from the penalty of sin. We've been restored from death. The Bible says we've moved from death to life. Now that's restoring, isn't it? Our dead bodies will be resurrected in glory. That's restoration, is it not? This is all the good news of the gospel. We have a God who loves us, who is compassionate to us. If we will repent of our sins, turn to Him, He restores, He blesses, He changes us. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Number three is to turn to God for salvation. So we acknowledge, yeah, judgment is, is a reality. God is gracious and loving, but I need to turn to Him for salvation. Salvation means to be saved from your sin, saved from the penalty of your sin, saved from death. All of these things must take place, or will take place when we turn to Jesus. Turn to God for salvation, verse 26, and afterward, what a beautiful promise this is. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. 
How many of y'all that sounds remotely interesting? Or you like you maybe you've heard that before? Anybody that's like, wait a minute, I think I've heard that before, right? Yeah, let's uh, turn over to, to Acts chapter two. In Acts chapter two, this is Pentecost. This is fifty days after Jesus went back to heaven and ascended back to heaven. The disciples were gathered there in the upper room. And Pentecost was a was a feast of of harvest. Who harvest? <laughs> the harvest. <laughs> And, and so they're, they're praying, and on that day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down and indwells the believers. And um, it's obvious that a change has taken place. And so Peter stands up before this large crowd, and it was so large that at least 3,000 people were saved that day and baptized. And so it could have been a larger crowd of even 6,000 people. But Peter stands up and he says this uh, in the last days God says I will pour out my spirit on all people your sons and your daughters will prophesy your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams Peter is quoting from Joel. Isn't that amazing? And so here you have the prophet Joel writing in 839 B.C. And at Pentecost, Peter is quoting him word for word, saying that the Holy Spirit is going to send down. He's going to do a work in people's lives. Isn't that good news? And so we have the, the reality that we have a loving God who's not only saved us from our sins and prepared a place for us in heaven, but he's actually sent his Holy Spirit to indwell inside of us Wow, we have a comforter. We have one who's going to teach us, guide us, who will always be with us, who's transforming us. He who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. That we're going to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, long-suffering. These are fruit, the fruit of the spirits inside of us. It just keeps getting better and better, doesn't it? Freed from death, freed from sin, home in heaven, the presence of Almighty God inside of us, the Holy Spirit to indwell us, empower us, lead us, guide us. It's incredible. This is the reality of the Word of God, and Peter is letting the people know God is at work, and God is still at work today, is He not? The same message from Joel is the same message in the church age. Pentecost began the church age. The church age started at Pentecost, and the church age is going to continue until Christ comes back, the day of Christ, and takes his church to heaven. The church age will be over, but then there's going to start that seven-year period of tribulation, capital T, tribulation, and God's going to do a work among his people in Israel, and a lot of people in Israel, because of the 144,000, because of these prophets, they're going to come to Christ as well, and God's going to pour his spirit on them. He pours his spirit on the church. He pours his spirit on Israel. God works the same way throughout all of history. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his message is the same message throughout time. Good news. Such good news. We have a loving God. We're an unfaithful people. We turn to the Lord in his grace and compassion. He saves us, redeems us, and fills us with his Holy Spirit. Wow. Verse 31, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, how many of you, verse 31, that sounds familiar to you? Anybody? It's like, wait a minute. Didn't we read that in the Olivet Discourse? Yes, we did. Jesus actually quotes this in Mark 13. Matthew 24, Luke 21. And so we say that, that Jesus is quoting Joel, but what's really happening is that Joel is quoting Jesus, right? Jesus is the one who said this in the first place. Jesus told Joel, hey, write this down. And then Jesus comes on the scene and, and just says the same thing that he told Joel. And so, yes, we have Peter's message quoting Joel. We have Jesus quoting Joel or quoting Jesus. Jesus quoting Jesus from Joel. And then look at this, the last verse. Verse 32. Amen. Let's read that together. Would y'all read that with me? And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. One more time. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That word L-O-R-D. Everyone who calls on Jesus will be saved. Now, how many of you heard that verse before? Like, wait a minute. I think I've heard that somewhere before. 
Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's look at Romans 10, verse 13. Romans 10, verse 13, Paul says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wow, the Apostle Paul is quoting from Joel. Jesus is quoting from Joel. Peter is quoting from Joel. How many of you know that Joel's got something to say, right? Because it's God's word. It's the same word back then as it is today. Yeah. And that truth is still the same truth today. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord. And so as we enter this time of communion, today might be your day to say, yes, Lord, I I'm calling on you today. Save me. Change me. Transform me. Lord, I confess my sins to you. I am a sinner in need of a Savior. By calling on the Lord, you will be saved. Saved from sin. Saved for service. Saved with a home in heaven. Saved from yourself. I want to read to you from uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, the words of Jesus. Jesus says this, and, and it says on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread. So if you'll go ahead and get your elements ready. And, and it says he took bread... And he gave thanks, and he broke the bread, and he gave to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So as we move into this time of communion, uh, Danny's going to come up, and he's going to play in the background. And one of the things that we're, we're so grateful for is our prayer team here. And so uh, Brother Joe, uh, he's usually up here. Uh, be praying for Joe, because Joe is actually driving back from Arkansas. He went to go visit his mom, who had... Like a 90th birthday or something like that? 90 something. Anyway. 90 what? 95th? His 95th birthday. His mom's 95th birthday. Anyway, so he, Joe's on the way back. Uh, and so we'll be praying for Joe. But at this time, Rez, who's also a part of our prayer team, is going to come. And, and so she's going to lead us in our time of prayer. And so if you'll go ahead and, and, and get out your, your element, Jesus, he took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And so before we receive the, the body, which represents the, the broken body of Jesus, the bread, um, Rez is going to lead us in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for offering your body as the perfect sacrifice for our own brokenness. Thank you that you took on all our sins, all our iniquities, our disease, pain, hopelessness. Thank you for your salvation. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so they took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it to them, saying, Take, uh, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, that God made him who had no sin, Jesus, to be sin for us, that we might have the righteousness of God. So as we remember communion, we remember that Jesus, who had no sin, becomes sin, becomes our sin, that we might have what? The righteousness of God. So that's what communion is, is remembering what Christ has done. So his body represents that bread which is broken for our sins and then this cup he said this cup uh, is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you so this cup represents his blood and so the old covenant was lambs and bulls and goats and they have to repeat that all the time the new covenant is Christ's blood once for all all sinners all of your sin past present and future has been paid for on the cross by Christ and so his blood represents that new covenant so before we receive the cup, Rez, if you'll pray for us. Father, we take this cup in faith, knowing that it symbolizes the blood of your son Jesus that was shed on the cross for the remissions of our sin. That because of his death and resurrection, because of that new covenant, Lord, we have been adopted into your kingdom. And we thank you that we have a seat at the table. And we worship you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So he says, uh, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Amen. 
God bless you. Thank you, Daryl. That was an awesome message. In point two, it talked about your whole heart. And if we're going to give our whole heart to the Lord, then it includes the wallet, right? I mean, if I'm going to give my whole heart, it means I'm going to give him everything I am and everything I have because I trust him and because he gave all to me, all he had to me. Will you pray with me today for our offering? Lord, thank you. Again, are never enough words. They're not adequate to say what you did for us. Thank you for giving your life for mine, and I didn't deserve it. Lord, I pray today that the offerings collected will reach people that don't yet know that grace that you have available to anyone who will take it. I pray that you as, help us as a church to reach people that don't yet know you. And I pray if there's anyone in here today, today is the day that they say, I want to know you as my personal Lord and Savior because I trust you to handle my life and my heart. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to uh, to share and to uh, do the ministry together. Yes, Lord, Lord to uh, reach people and to expand your kingdom and uh, to be the church. Yes, We're grateful that we have a redemption and salvation, and that we're your body. The body is all over the place, and Lord, so we just pray for our brothers and sisters that will receive this yes. uh, material. Yes. Uh, these. Uh, Items, these tools for ministry. Yes. I pray that you will bless them virtually. I pray that you will use each of these things, Lord, to help uh, people come to know you. Yes. And so we pray for uh, boys and girls and men and women to come to know you, to follow you, to grow in you, to be discipled, uh, to reach others. And so we just pray that all this stuff will be used by you for your kingdom and for your glory. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. 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 Father, thank you for Aqua's Church, Lord. Thank you for Pastor Darren, Lord God, and the leadership, Lord God, extending their love and their compassion and their concern about churches in other parts of the world. Thank you that may these tools, Lord God, be used for your glory. Thank you for their hearts, Lord God, to extend the love for other souls, Lord God, in other parts of the world. Lord. Protect this box, Lord God, that it will reach Lord safely in the Philippines. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hello Upwards people, my name is Rez and uh, that's my very good looking husband Danny. Uh, we've been married 37 years this year in November. So we've lived long enough and if you're like us, you look over your life, it is impossible not to see the goodness of God. Now this box, uh, I tracked the shipping this morning and it's going to arrive in the Philippines on May 7th. And uh, thank you all because the contents of this box probably don't mean much to some of you. But when they go over the Philippines, it's a world of difference for those churches there who had who have who ha have nothing no no um i mean the microphones as good as this one so they're gonna use those contents to reach other people and to be effective at sharing the gospel and preaching the gospel of god um so uh we're going to sing a song called thank you so this is kind of a testimony of our lives um, I was born into a very poor family by poor it means we had no electricity no water guess who fetched the water <laughs> me uh, from a far away well so um, you know but God is God is good 
My, my parents, they barely finished elementary school. And they worked so hard, but it wasn't enough to send me and my three other sisters to school. But at that point, when I was about third, in the third and fourth grade, um, my school had a sponsorship program for poor kids. So people from America were giving money to that school, maybe every month, I don't know, maybe every year. And that money was used so children like me could stay in school. And not only me, but my sisters too. We were all able to graduate high school, then I went to college, and then I got a good job. I got into the ministry, and that's where I met Danny. We got married, we have four kids, and um, 24 years ago, we moved here, I went to Arizona, and then to Texas. And, and all those big milestones in our lives, we see them coming into fruition as a blessing from God through the generosity of people like you, people who were strangers, people who did not know us, people who we did not know. We wouldn't be able to repay them. They would gain nothing from helping us. It was just from the abundance of their heart and from their love to the Lord that they gave and invested in me personally and invested in, in our ministry that now we are able to stand here in humility but also in confidence because God is good. And all this giving that we give as a church, ultimately at the end of the day, this will go toward the transformation of many lives. Lives that are being changed and lives that are being built into a generous life, into a loving life. So that too, you know, this, this church is where this box is going to and the children that will benefit, they too one day will be able to give and continue the cycle of giving and generosity. And, and that's why Danny and I, about six years ago, we started a nonprofit program, nonprofit organization. So we also could help a little bit sending kids like me to school when I was a little kid. Couldn't their parents couldn't afford to send them to school. And also to help small churches who are serving in struggling communities. So thank you all. Um, another box from upwards is going to, uh, after that being delivered, there's another one coming. It just takes a long time <laughs> to get the boxes there. But thank you so much. And this is a song called Thank You. And this is thanks to God and thanks to the people he uses so that the ministry can go on.
Awesome testimony. Thank you for giving that to us today. Um, if you are a first time guest, hopefully you received your free gift on your way in. If not, swing by our connection center. I'm sure you'll all smell this wonderful food out there. I want everybody to stay because there's a lot of food that I saw bring brought in. Plenty for everyone. If you didn't bring anything, don't worry. There's plenty. We're church people. We bring lots of food. <laughs> Yes, a few instructions about the food. So the desserts and the drinks will be back in the fellowship hall, which is just, just on the right-hand side. So anybody that wants to start with drinks and dessert, you can go back there. But uh, everything else, the food is going to start right here, at this, uh, right when you open these doors. And so if our line could kind of be through here, that would really help with the congestion that way. So I'm going to pray for our food. And then those of you that want to eat, just start right here or start in there with the drinks and the dessert. Let me pray for our, our food. And thank you for being here today. Uh, Lord, we're, we're grateful. We are thankful for all that you've done in our lives. We're grateful that we can come and worship you today. We're grateful that we can uh, sit down and, and have a meal together as a church family. Thank you so much for everyone uh, who brought food. And thank you so much for everyone that's here to enjoy the blessings and the fellowship that we will share. So we ask for you to bless our food to our bodies. And we thank you so much for the time that we've had together today. We ask all these things in the name above every name, the name of Jesus and God's people said, Amen. Amen. Come! 